All right. Found the on button. We are going to start in one minute. So I do invite you, those of you in the back again, if you would like to come sit around the table, if you still find open spaces, feel free to come up and join us at the table so we have a real round table conversation as it was announced. Thank you. I'm not sure, can you hear me if I speak this way? Can the interpreters hear and captioners also? Perfect, okay. So that I don't have to shout into that <coughs> microphone. Thank you so much everyone for making the time um, and uh, come to this pre-event, um, day zero event organized by the International Chamber of Commerce. My name is Timio Schutte. I am Global Digital Policy Lead at ICC and um, I will be your moderator today. This session is entitled Aligning Priorities for a Shared Vision on Digital Policy. Big words, uh, but what we really want to do here today is to have a conversation um, with uh, distinguished speakers from the public and the private sector uh, and really take stock of all the policy discussions that have happened already this year um, in various intergovernmental, multi-stakeholder fora um, and try and find some commonalities that we all share that we can take forward um, as we're looking ahead uh, into major policy discussions coming up um, in the next year, in the next years, uh, both in the UN, um, in intergovernmental fora outside of the UN or other multi-stakeholder discussions as it is uh, the mandate uh, and the vision of the IGF to always do so. Um, so to do this, um, I really am not going to be the one to discuss it. Um, I'm just going to try and facilitate the discussion with all of you and our distinguished panelists um, who um, are joining me around the table here today. So without um, any major uh, protocol, <laughs> I'm just going to go uh, and introduce them as they are on my list. Um, so we have um, Mr. Alan Davidson, Assistant Secretary for Communications and Information at the National Telecommunication Information Administration, um, NTIA, at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, come out, <coughs> Alan. We have Ms. Natasha Crampton, Vice President, Chief Responsible AI Officer at Microsoft. Welcome, Natasha. We have Ms. Melinda Claybaugh, Director of Privacy Policy at Meta. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we also have Mr. Nathan Yelly, coordinator um, of the Internet Steering Committee of the Government of Brazil. Thank you for coming. Mr. Makoto Yokozawa, um, ambassador to the Asia region um, of the, our Global Policy um, Digital Economy Commission at the International Chamber of Commerce. Mr. David Fairchild, first secretary for digital policy and cybersecurity at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, Mr. Alessandro Gropelli, uh, deputy director general at um, ETNO, the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association online and Mr. Thomas Fulmer, Head of Global Content Delivery Policy at um, Netflix. Thank you, panel, for joining us. Uh, they are going to be our thought starters uh, and instigators for conversation and debate. Um, we um, have agreed with the panel to look into three major policy areas, um, three thematic conversations while we are here for the next two hours. Um, we are going to start um, our conversation on AI governance. Um, we are going to then look into uh, data governance and wrap up the session uh, with the base uh, of everything that is digital. Um, so conversations on connectivity and digitalization and we're going to look at that uh, through the lens of development. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, my three uh, first speakers to prepare. We will have Mr. Davidson, Ms. Crampton and Ms. Claybaugh um, discuss with us a little bit about AI. Um, we will try and take stock of the development and initiatives that um, have happened around this topic in the past year um, on AI governance, how to address challenges uh, from moving um, from principles of AI that we all know into implementation, um, and really the role of the global community in ensuring um, uh, a more inclusive and harmonized approach to, to AI uh, governance. Um, I will ask my panelists to keep to their allocated five minutes so that we have also some time for reactions for those around um, the table and some comments online if we can. So with that, um, Alan, I'd like to turn to you first um, to ask you to provide a, a bit of an overview of the efforts made towards uh, creating uh, AI frameworks built on trust and development um, and responsibility, both on the domestic front in the U.S. and a little bit of the international fora that you are uh, involved in. Okay. Okay. Shall I try? 
try and use this? Let's try you. Okay, we'll see how that goes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Timea, and, um, and thank you to the International Chamber for bringing us together for this conversation, and I will say um, uh, for being such a good partner for many years here uh, in these internet governance conversations. And we are here today uh, because of the growing power of technology in everybody's daily lives. And particularly, the growing power uh, is very obvious of um, artificial intelligence and uh, these new machine learning tools, uh, which have really surpassed much of what many of us expected. Even in a very hyped space, uh, uh, the hype has gotten <laughs> uh, overtaken in some ways by the reality of, uh, of what, is, uh, what is happening out there. Um, responsible innovation in AI will bring enormous benefits to people. Uh, but we will only realize that potential if we deal with the very real risks that AI poses and the, the risks that it poses today. Um, it's clear that AI is going to be revolutionary. Machine learning tools are going to make their way into many parts of the economy from drug discovery to precision agriculture. We're already seeing how these tools are going to change people's lives. Um, but today it's also clear that there is cause for concern about these risks and the potential harms from use of AI. We have to look at both. Experts have raised a pretty broad spectrum of risk, and I'll just say a few words about how we've been thinking about this. There's some value in some ways in bifurcating what we see as the risks. Um, some people have focused quite a bit on the very, on serious long-term risks to safety, security, um, humanity, uh, and uh, uh, these are serious risks. They deserve serious attention, um, but they're also very speculative and they're long term. Uh, so we're giving them consideration, um, uh, which they deserve. At the same time, though, I think it's worth putting, taking, a, looking at a second track here of risk, which are the the very real risks that are on the short term time horizon are already people are already facing from the machine learning systems that are the models that are being deployed and used today. And those include concerns about safety and security, privacy, um, the impact on human rights, discrimination, bias in some of these models, and um, risks from disinformation, risks uh, uh, and about around the impact on the labor market. And so we do need to be thinking about those risks today. Um, Fortunately, there is a strong sense of urgency, both in the U.S. government and I think in governments around the world. We've captured the imagination of policymakers, which can be a blessing or a curse, but uh, um, uh, we've take, let me say a few words about what we've been doing in the U.S. government. First, uh, we've received a set of, uh, secured a set of commitments from leading companies, uh, some of the leading companies working on the frontier models in this space. Uh, 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 Microsoft and Meta uh, among them. And those commitments, I think, uh, offer a real short-term and impactful way to address uh, major concerns around safety, security, and trust. So that has been a big starting point for us, and those were developed uh, in very short order over the, since the springtime. Um, that's an important first step and a bridge to further executive action, legislation, and international cooperation, which is our focus right now. Uh, the U.S. is developing an executive order right now, uh, which will uh, uh, ensure that the federal government's doing everything that's in our power and the current authorities that we have. Our regulatory agencies have pledged to vigorously use their authorities uh, to make sure that they're protecting individuals. Uh, we expect that there will be further guidance from the US government coming out about how we procure and use AI, which can be a powerful driver in the market because we are a big customer and we're a big developer. Um, our national, my colleagues at the National Institute of Standards and Technology are working on a risk management framework. Actually, they've developed a risk management framework. Uh, we encourage people to look at it, to use it, a powerful set of tools for thinking about risk in the space. At NTIA, we're deep into some work around accountability and audits and uh, did a request for comments, got over 1,400 comments about what, how do we build the auditing ecosystem? What does accountability look like? So there'll be a report coming out on that by the end of the month. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, by the end of the year. Um, we're also talking to about bipartisan legislation that we're trying to, we're hoping for uh, potentially in our Congress. Uh, we'll see what happens there, but uh, there, so far there are 
a lot of interesting efforts to try to educate uh, for members of Congress to get educated. All told, I just it paints a picture of real engagement and urgency at, in, the, in the U.S. government, more than we've seen on many issues, certainly not within this kind of time frame. Um, and uh, I will just say, uh, and I don't want to go over my time, we can, I'll save some for the, of the international piece for later, but, uh, but it, we recognize that those domestic efforts must be ultimately harmonized with international efforts as well. Uh, the impact of AI is global. Our response needs to match that scope. Uh, we are deeply engaged right now in a number of different venues, the OECD, the Global Partnership on AI, um, the AI for Good conference that just happened, the, um, uh, the G7 Hiroshima process, and more. So I look forward to the conversation around what those can look like, and I'll just say, um, you know, AI has captured the public imagination over the last year. This is an opportunity for us to be thinking about how we build these frameworks. Uh, we're doing a lot domestically in the U.S., but look forward to talking about the international piece as well. Thank you so much, Ellen, and, and thank you for really setting up the next two speakers so, so well. Uh, as you already mentioned, private sector efforts on, um, on some of this work that you are already doing um, uh, on the domestic front. Um, and we'll make some time for the international piece um, uh, in, in the Q&A and reaction statements right after. Um, so, Natasha, let me turn to you first and, and just re ask on um, what are some of the considerations and concrete examples that you can share from, from within Microsoft and <coughs> your colleagues perhaps also uh, on how the private sector sets and, and implements some of these principles um, and these policy initiatives that, that Alan was mentioning earlier um, and how do we do this to, to develop safe, transparent, inclusive, and, and human-centric AI systems? There you go. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today and to be a part of this discussion. Our responsible AI work at Microsoft is, is really built on the basis of, of two fundamental premises. The first is that people don't use technology that they don't trust. And the second is that if you are building technology that changes the world, then we believe that we have a responsibility to make sure that it's developed and used responsibly as well. So we've been working on our responsible AI program at Microsoft now for uh, about seven years. Uh, in fact, we have about 350 people across the company working on uh, these topics on a daily basis. I'm going to offer a few insights about how we have moved from sort of high-level principles uh, that we adopted back in 2018 into concrete practices um, within the company, and that we continue to advance, including through uh, you know recent commitments we've made, such as the White House commitments. So first, I just want to talk a bit about our foundation of governance, because we do uh, believe that governance is really the foundation for accountability and, and progress. So our whole program is uh, framed in an enterprise risk management uh, uh, construct. Uh, and the reason we've done that is that that then allows us to pull on all of the corporate infrastructure that we have to manage enterprise risks at our company. And, you know, it's not just Microsoft that has uh, an enterprise risk management program. Many organizations uh, uh, across various different sectors have similar framing. So we've been able to sort of take pages out of the playbooks that we've used for privacy and accessibility and security to actually operationalize our work. We try and uh, combine uh, the strength of three um, different parts of Microsoft when we do this work. Our researchers, our policy teams, and our engineers. Um, we are fortunate at Microsoft to have Microsoft Research as a part of the organization and uh, privileged to have uh, world-leading researchers on fairness and transparency, and we really rely on them uh, to make sure that we are looking around the corners, seeing the new risk surfaces, understanding the very best methods for mitigating risks, and then pulling those into our practice within the company. I lead our Office of Responsible AI, which is the team responsible for uh, policy and governance and enablement of the effort. So, you know, we organize training, for example, across the company to make sure that our engineers and sales teams are ready to, to do this work. 
And then, of course, our engineering partners are essential stakeholders uh, in this effort. Fundamentally, Microsoft is a product building company, and so we need to have our engineers at the table working shoulder to shoulder with our policy experts and our researchers to help bring our commitments to life. Um, we have a network of responsible AI champions uh, or champs across the company. Um, these are individuals in the engineering teams, um, also in our sales teams around the world. And we essentially operate a hub and a spoke model. So we have um, you know, centralized policies set by my team working in partnership with the engineers and the researchers. And then we empower our engineering teams, including their responsible AI uh, champs and their accountable leaders uh, to implement uh, those requirements. The second thing that we've built are our standardised rules across the company. So, uh, as I mentioned, back in 2018, we adopted a set of high-level principles um, that AI systems should be fair, private and secure, uh, reliable and safe, um, inclusive, transparent and accountable. All principles that continue to um, be durable and serve as our North Star, but clearly that's not enough to guide a, a product building team as to what they need to do. So we uh, have developed what we call our responsible AI standard. Um, ultimately, we've made this available publicly, which uh, is essentially a double click down on each of those principles and spells out, for example, what does fairness mean at Microsoft? We've identified three different types of fairness and then we've uh, set out the steps that our teams need to follow in order to uh, uphold that principle in their day-to-day -day practice. But as everyone here knows, you know, for all of uh, the effort that there is to try and develop these types of rulemaking um, or these rule-based frameworks, you know, not everything about uh, complex socio-technical AI systems can be reduced to a set of predefined rules in advance. And so we have a process at the company that we call uh, a sensitive uses, where for particularly high impact use cases, um, they're reported into a, a team within my office and then we uh, guide them through a special process to make sure they get additional oversight and additional um, uh, requirements on top of the baseline requirements. Uh, so we have that type of process in play as well. Um, Tools and practices are a really important part of actually getting this uh, work done on a daily basis as an everyday part of the engineering process. So as we at Microsoft have built tools to do uh, our responsible AI work, we've tended to make them available to our customers as well. As our customers routinely tell us that they're grappling with the same types of issues. And so we've made some of our tools available as open source packages or um, at times we've integrated them into our AI development platform so that our cu customers can take advantage of them there. I'll just um, uh, sort of finish here by saying that, um, you know, for all of these different elements, the governance pieces, the rulemaking pieces, the oversight, the checks and balances, I think, um, you know, while I'm, I'm, you know, confident in the foundation that we have at Microsoft, we have to recognize that this is still a really fast moving space. It is still in its early days. And so a core part of what we're trying to build at Microsoft is um, an agile framework that is responsive to new risk surfaces, um, to new methods and ways of mitigating risk. Um, because that is what the future holds for us. So uh, while we put much of this uh, in place before ChatGPT hit the scenes and uh, a sort of uh, became, uh, had, had its cultural moment, um, it, it, we do need, of course, to keep evolving as generative AI systems reveal new risk surfaces. And, you know, to Alan's point earlier, we're constantly trying to find the right balance between making sure that we address the here and the now risks of AI systems, as well as the longer or the medium and longer term risks as well. Oh. <laughs> we are sharing, sharing this, <laughs> passing it around like around the campfire. It's great. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to turn to um, to Melinda and, and ask how you see um, this space from from your point of view at Meta. Um, and if you could just maybe take stock a little bit about the voluntary commitments that are uh, out there for developing uh, responsible AI um, and how we coordinate towards uh, governance of, of this space. 
Is this working? Yes, okay. Um, sure, happy to. So I think it's important to kind of take a step back initially to think about what's going on here. And the way that we think about it is there's really, um, in the space of AI governance, there's really three things that are that are that need to happen and that they all need to progress at the same time. I think the first step is really around high level global harmonized principles um, that we're seeing start to take shape. Um, there are dozens of initiatives going on now globally um, and we've seen some real early promising signs from the OECD AI principles to the voluntary White House commitments now to the G7 Hiroshima process, which are all kind of circling the same types of issues and concerns, and I think that's a really promising step. Um, it will be incredibly important to bring that harmonization together across those instruments to provide uh, certainty and clarity to companies that are investing in the space that want to get into the space to understand generally the, the rules of the road. Um, I think it is really important also to have that conversation be very broad, um, including eff you know, tying together with existing efforts in the global south. So there are ongoing efforts in ASEAN and the African Union that also have to be brought into the fold um, and so that this is a truly global approach to AI principles. I think the second track that is also running <laughs> at the same time um, is uh, there are some issues in the space that need to be looked at by industry and standard setting bodies where it will be really critical to have common industry approaches. So I'm thinking in particular around red teaming or labeling of AI generated content where all of the actors in the ecosystem need to be building a common approach so that, for example, in the labeling space that users have a common understanding of when you know, interacting with AI-generated content. Um, so I think it's really important that those um, industry and standard setting and technical conversations are still moving along at the same time. And then I think the third area of AI governance is hard regulation. Um, and I think that is necessarily kind of gonna be on a longer time frame than the other two. And that's because there are already um, existing laws that are in place in a lot of countries. And countries have very different legal uh, regimes set up. So there isn't going to be a one size fits all approach for AI. So you have to really grapple with existing data protection laws, existing discrimination laws, existing copyright laws. Um, and so the, the um, answers are going to, the regulation is going to look different in every country. But I think those are the three buckets that we need to be progressing kind of at the same time. And so not every issue is going to fall in, in every bucket, but there's a role absolutely for, for all three of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a clear, concise, um, and, and very ambitious plan in, 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 in three points. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and now I really want to open up a little bit for everybody around the table. Um, we'll have about 10 minutes um, to share any questions or any additional perspectives uh, that you might have. And as we think about that, I'm going to turn back to Ellen and maybe ask if you want to share those couple of points on the international scene that you wanted to, to share. Uh, no, it's fine. It's uh, all right? I'll, yeah, that's good. Let's, let's hear from folks. That's let's hear better. from folks then. Anybody would like to react to what we've heard already, ask a question? Please. It will be. It is now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought was somebody should be first. Um, so four very short points um, to sort of talk across some of the things that I've covered. Um, I think it's important to talk about the sort of whether there's ethical um, constraints around the training of models so that there's not permissionless use of content. Um, and also that there's appropriate use of the people um, in the sort of content farms um, where there certainly are the reports of uh, poor conditions for the, for, the, for the folks that are actually having to load the content in, into models. Um, there's certainly enormous issues about the, the sort of the open versus closed models. 
Um, and I, for my sins, I'm a trustee of the Internet Watch Foundation. We're already seeing people taking advantage of open models to uh, develop uh, AI-produced CSAM, um, which is uh, both extremely disappointing, to say the least. Um, also, it, ra it raises enormous enforcement problems because it's increasingly hard to uh, determine whether something's AI-produced or not. Uh, so you don't know whether there's a victim um, that, that, that needs to be found and rescued um, or, or not. Clearly, labelling would have would be helpful there, but if it's an open model, uh, then potentially people are able to bypass all the constraints, um, and uh, uh, you probably won't have labelling uh, with open models. So that feels like that's a bad um, uh, d development. Uh, and then finally, given that there's potential contamination of all of the sort of the world's content um, by models where they're producing content. I think I'd argue you know, that there is a case for the application, application of the precautionary principle to regulation in this space. Um, so rather than, to, to the last point, regulation catching up later, maybe it's worth discussing whether actually it should be the other way around, that uh, it, you know, the, 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 uh, the companies need to justify the use and show that it's safe uh, in, in over the long term before it's allowed rather than um, the, the legislation having to somehow catch up and repair the damage. Thank you for that. Can I just please ask you to maybe introduce yourself so we know that who, who we heard from? Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, yes, Andrew Campling. Uh, my company is 419 Consulting. I work in the internet standard space and as I say, I'm also a trustee of the Internet Watch Foundation which detects and removes CSAM. Thank you so much. And thanks for introducing yourself also, Andrew. Um, any other comments or, or maybe a question from the floor? Please. Hello, my name is Franka Wegner and I'm coming directly with my colleague from the Youth IGF. So I would be really interested if um, in your regulation, youth participation and the in inclusion of young people who are the main users of the technology in the end uh, plays a role or in which way, so this is something we would be really interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Franca. So, trying to look behind my back, if there was any questions maybe there? No, and none online? <laughs> then I will ask uh, m the panelists in the, in the order um, that they were speaking first to maybe reflect on some of these, these questions or share some of the last um, takeaways uh, also reacting to each other's points of what can we really take forward as we look into um, global uh, interoperable uh, governance uh, of AI at this international space. What are the lessons that, that we've learned from what you've shared? Um, what are we learning from, from other stakeholders? How are we involving other stakeholders? And, and what should the IGF take note of um, as we think about formulating the messages uh, that will go forward from, from this forum? So I'm going to turn uh, first to, to you, Alan, if you would like. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe three quick quick reflections. One is, um, well, first of all, I, first of all, I'd start by saying, you know, we really are at a time of um, transition in this discussion, and I think we do have to th think about, uh, even as we continue to develop principles, as even global principles uh, and frameworks, we at the same time need to pivot to action. Uh, there's been a lot of work on a lot of different principles and frameworks for many years now, and they are, it is ongoing. But I, I think the world is demanding a bit more action from us. Um, the voluntary commitments that I spoke of uh, are an example of that kind of action uh, from our perspective in the US government. And um, I'm encouraged by them. Uh, the hope is that we can use them to build upon, right? It's something that we can do right now. I'm uh, uh, great, we're very grateful to the companies who've been uh, part of this. Uh, but the hope would ultimately be to expand 
uh, those, that set of companies and to expand this internationally. And so, uh, as f folks know, we're working on a, uh, a code of conduct, uh, an international code of conduct for advanced AI developers through the G7 Hiroshima process. I think there'll be some discussion uh, forthcoming uh, from the organizers of the, of the process uh, later in uh, our program this week, uh, and uh, we're encouraged by that. Um, a second big thing is I just say we continue to believe in the multi-stakeholder process uh, in this space, which is partly why I wanted to be here today with all of you. You all will be an important part of this. Um, there was a huge role for governments here. You're seeing governments step forward. But as we have seen in all of these uh, areas around um, internet policy, technology policy, we are stronger when we are using a multi-stakeholder process, when we are in, when governments are informed by technical experts and business experts, civil society, um, we are much stronger altogether. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, maybe something to the. Uh, I'm so glad the point was raised about the youth IGF and the need to make sure that we have the voices and we're thinking about um, the experiences of young people in this. So I'm so glad you're here. Um, and uh, if there's anything that gives me hope in this space it is that we are really embracing these issues probably earlier in the life cycle of this set of technology than we have before. Um, uh, I know that probably seems strange to say considering it's been years that we've already been talking about AI, but when you look at uh, the early days of the internet as it were, I've been in this space now for over 25 years I guess and thinking about internet governance, we were slow to get society really engaged and what I am most encouraged by. I teach um, or have taught at some of our universities in the US to see how much young people who are, even young computer scientists developing technology care so much more, I think, about the impact of the tools they're building than we've seen in the past. And that is really wonderful and cause for hope. So thank you for raising the point. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that and thank you for bringing up that point. Um, it, it is quite hopeful that we are uh, more ahead than we thought we were, especially if you look into uh, comparison with others. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, that should give us some, some hope uh, and <laughs> encouragement that there's still a lot to do. Um, and, uh, and all around the table, we are, I'm sure we're committed to doing uh, what, what needs to be done. Um, Natasha, how do you see uh, this moving uh, at the international space? What is it that we, we can learn from? Thank you. I, I think the first thing that needs to happen at the international level is um, to move towards, as much as possible, some sort of consensus on risk and risk in a number of uh, different dimensions, different types of risk across different time frames. And I think we need to acknowledge that there are you know, some risk today that we understand well and that we can identify well, we can measure well, we can mitigate well. We want to be able to get to that same pattern for all different types of risk, but not all of them, the state of the art is not there for all of the um, risks that are out there, especially some of the longer term risks. But I think we should aspire to get to a place where we can uh, both identify those risks and measure and mitigate them well. But some sort of consensus on risk, I think, really uh, does make sense. Second, I, I do agree with uh, Melinda's point earlier about the need for uh, standards in this space. Um, they can't be just technical standards because we are dealing fundamentally with um, what we'd call socio-technical issues here, right? These issues about the safe and secure performance of AI systems are right at the intersection between technology and society, which is why, you know, fundamentally we need to keep a very human-centered approach. And it's also why these standards can be quite difficult to actually define uh, at times. But we need to push through that and define uh, common standards. Uh, and ultimately uh, make sure that they are enforced by law so that people do have protection under the law. I think that's a very important part of getting to um, the sort of framework that the world needs here. And then finally, I'd say we need to work on the infrastructure for, for doing this well. And I think the infrastructure can be thought of 
in a number of different dimensions. I think one part of the infrastructure should be how do we do multi-stakeholder uh, consultations and engagements while including with youth and other, you know, in, in a very inclusive way that is, uh, includes the Global South, for example. We do need infrastructure for AI governance around the world. I think a different type of infrastructure that we need is we need to make sure that academics around the world have access to the right type of computing resources that are needed to do AI safety research well and to play the important uh, accountability uh, role and function that they play uh, in society by you know, testing systems that might come from an AI developer like Microsoft and finding new insights and contributing to that dialogue. So I'd say those three things, coming to some sort of consensus on risk, advancing those socio-technical standards so that there's a sort of common set of rules of the road and then building out the infrastructure for AI governance so that it can be inclusive um, and also effective um, for managing this risk, this, this set of risks, not just today, but into the future. Um, you know, there is just so much potential with this technology that it's worth the effort now and an ongoing basis to put this, these uh, types of measures in place. Thank you so much. Um, this, we're trying to capture all of the notes and put it into the re report. And so without me trying to, to, um, to summarize here, um, I really do rely on, on panelists to bring in all these different perspectives and we will gather all that into, into the report. And, and I already see it's gonna be a very rich one. Uh, so um, Melinda, what's, what's your addition to some of these takeaways? Yeah, I really echo some of the, the views that were just shared, but in particular about moving from principles to action. Um, and I think one aspect of that that is really important is putting some of these principles into practice and testing them. Mm. Um, and so I know, for example, NIST in the United States is seeking testing and interpretation of its risk management framework. Um, I think that's a great initiative. Um, something at Meta that we've invested in over the last few years is um, in particular, um, we worked with many, many startups and companies um, through a partnership with the um, Data Protection Authority in Singapore on testing out system cards and how do you, um, uh, you know, share information about a model and how it works so that people who are interacting with the model actually understand <laughs> what's going on. And so that takes a lot of testing and iteration to, to kind of translate that in a way that people will will understand. Um, we also um, helped facilitate a program um, in Europe a couple years ago with the initial proposal of the um, EU AI Act, where we convened many, many stakeholders um, from different areas to test out some of the language in the Commission's proposal on the EU AI Act, and how would that work in practice. So I think we have to get a little creative um, in a way maybe we haven't had to in, in prior areas of actually seeing how some of this plays out in practice um, and I think that will help companies including startups and smaller companies um, understand what is what is expected and provide really valuable feedback um, to governments the one other thing I wanted to highlight and picking up a little bit on the open source conversation um, we are investing very heavily in um, an open source approach so we um, released a large language model over the summer called llama 2 um, and we're making that available um, to everyone pursuant to uh, a responsible you know, use license. Um, and I think that that's a really important step in specifically in terms of testing and understanding um, a model's capabilities and weaknesses and security issues potentially. And so we feel strongly that that is the, the better approach is to open source models so that they can be um, pressure tested and that information that is gathered by security researchers and others, we can feed back in to our models. We uh, presented our model at the International DEF CON con conference um, recently and hackers took their, their best stabs at it um, and really pressure tested it. And so I think that openness and transparency is also part of this kind of approach to testing of putting things out there within reason obviously um, and and making them stronger as a result. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and, and really, uh, the panel has, has come full circle. You have mentioned uh, that the world is demanding more action, and we see some of the examples both uh, at the um, government level, certainly see that in, in a private sector um, in, in a voluntary way. Um, I take it uh, from all of you that we need to make sure that we communicate this better to one another, um, to involve the stakeholders and create processes for them to, to be part of it, um, to allow innovation to move at the same uh, time as we are considering about its impact um, and to make sure that we, uh, that we operationalize some of these um, ideas in a way that um, uh, they can be tested, um, they can be improved upon, um, that in the end uh, actually involve all of us and move all of us forward um, and are responsive to that call that the, that the world is, uh, is asking for. So thank you for, for this really amazing first, first half hour. Um, so we're going to move a bit away from the AI conversation, but not too far. We're leaping into the data domain, uh, which is really closely linked in with the conversation with AI. Um, and there is um, a lot of progress that has been made in, in recent years about talking about uh, data governance, uh, but there's still a, a, a lot of changes um, that need to be uh, thought about and a lot of challenges that need to be addressed, especially uh, when we're thinking about setting up an open, free, and unfragmented internet that is anchored in open, free, and unfragmented data policies and data flows. Um, so how do, we, how do we think about this, both at a domestic level, at the international level, um, and across different stakeholder groups? So I will have Mr. Renata Mieli and Mr. Makoto Yokozawa uh, unpack this first for, for you, and then we'd love to hear again from the room uh, before we draw some lessons. So I'm going to pass my microphone over here and ask uh, Renata, how do you see this in, in Brazil, especially, um, and also you're looking ahead to hosting the G20. Okay. Oh, let me arrange this first. Uh. Thank you, Timea, and, thank you, and thanks to the International Chamber of Commerce for, invi for the invitation to talk about uh, uh, this very important uh, challenge. In, well, uh, for us, one of the main challenges to responsible and ethical data governance is aligning it with the reduction of inequality and the generation of opportunities one of the pillars of the Sustainable Development, development Agenda. To achieve this, we need to produce policies that guarantee that data are collected and used to benefit of all society, not just the private sector. Data governance must be seen by states as a strategic policy that starts with the investment in critical infrastru infrastructure, data centers, for example, to the production of regulatory mechanisms. This is important to protect individual rights, almost uh, principally, particularly in, in the EIA uh, transformation, and to promote innovation and drive economic development. And also must be seen as a, as a multi-stakeholder process with an important participation of civil society organization in the development of these policies. Brazil is a country with great potential for the development of a strong, inclusive digital ecosystem. We have been working to promote international cooperation in data, govern data governance. In 2021, the country signed the G7 Declaration Digital Government and Open Data, which commits the country to promoting cross-border data flows in the development of international data governance standards. Brazil has also committed to working with other countries to develop international data governance, stand, data governance standards that are balanced and protect individual rights. The, GZ, the G7 declaration is an important step towards promoting cross-border data flows and the development of international data governance standards. Brazil's participation in the declaration is a sign of the country's commitment to these goals. In addition to international commitments, we have already made with the G7 Brazil's intentions during its leadership in the G20 is to lead discussions on data governance from a perspective of inclusion and diversity. 
and policies that actually view data as a resource for economic induction, but also for social empowerment. Okay. To address the challenges of data governance in a way that is aligned with the sustainable development agenda, we can consider adopting the following proposals. Strengthening the regulatory framework. We need to strengthen the regulatory framework for data, gov data governance, ensure that data are collected and used in a responsible and ethical manner in accordance with international human, ri human rights standards. This includes ensuring that individuals have meaningful control over their personal da data and that data is not used to discriminate against or harm marginalized, marginalized groups. Invest in national sovereign, sovereignty uh, infrastructures. We need to invest in that infra infrastructure in a way that promotes national sovereignty and envir environmental sustainab sustainability. This includes developing public and private data center and cloud computing infrastructures in global south countries using renewable energy sources and other sustainab sustainable practices. Develop harmonious global policies for data flows. We need to cooperate internationally to develop harmonious policies for data flows, ensure that public interest data are made available for the benefit of society. This includes promotion open data and data sharing initiatives, while also protecting the privacy and security of personal da data. Develop accountability mechanisms for AI data, AI the data sets. We are talking about this uh, just now. We need to develop international standards for accountability in AA data sets to prevent the reproduction of discriminatory biases by design. This includes ensuring that AI data sets are transparent and auditable and that there are mechanisms in place to address any biases that are identified. Uh, we think that a world where data is used for good where everyone has the opportunity to benefit from its power and where our digital footer is built on a foundation of trust and respect for human, human rights. That are the principles Brazil wants to uh, drive during he, its leadership on G20. Thanks. Thank you so much, Renata and um, for, for sharing all of that and, and it was really a, a good uh, overview of everything from the G7 to the G20 to national priorities um, that's that's really uh, packed in, in in five minutes so um, I'm going to turn to to Makoto Yokozawa um, to um thank you yeah <laughs> sorry I didn't <laughs> see the signal um, um, to, to share some of your views on, on what you what you think the private sector feels uh, on some of the same issues, um, data free flows with trust, uh, uh, governance models for data, um, both uh, in domestic and international settings. That's great, thank you. Uh, well, uh, as a citizen of this host country of this uh, IGF, so I would like to welcome all of you to this ancient capital of Japan. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, this capital has, uh, was opened at in the 794, 794, it's over the 1,000 years, it's a very old one. So every, every Japanese will remember this 794 as this is <laughs> a, a common knowledge in, in around in the elementary school, <laughs> okay. So, um, and also I am working uh, with the ICC uh, DEC, DEC, Digital Economic Commission, and the basis. So uh, uh, again, I, I would like to welcome you all of you to this uh, great session. So uh, the Ms. Miele's uh, sp uh, talk is very, very impressive. And the, uh, I, will, I will say something from the uh, business perspective, which is the, uh, the, both, uh, the other side of the coins of the, the data, free f data flows. So uh, the I would summarize, uh, before talking uh, many things, but the I, I would summarize that my talk should be the, uh, the, uh, the some, some sort of the economy of trust, so, and or the uh, trust-based trade or business. So this is the, uh, the overarching message from my 
side that the, uh, the because in the economy of trust is not a new word, so very classical word, but uh, the, the meaning is changing. Uh, and we we are having uh, we are having this discussion about the, the free flow of trade, a uh, free flow of data, and many other things like the AI discussion in the, the past in, in the last sessions. So, the uh, it's a not a new pro uh, paradigm uh, the economy of trust, and the, uh, the uh, uh, we have we have discussed about the consumer confidence or the investors' confidence, which is a very important uh, resources for business. However, uh, there uh, are the number of the reasons why the data-driven economy needs trust even more to uh, mitigate costs and risk. This is a very important part of the trust. So trust can uh, mitigate the cost for business. And the, and, and the trust can mitigate the risks in doing the business or doing the data flows or doing AI development. And so that's why we need trust in data governance. So that's the first message from me. And what we are discussing in Japan, from Japan, and uh, together with the business, uh, business sectors and together with the government of Japan is the uh, G7 process and G20 process and also the OECD process. So and the, uh, that's very important even for the private sector. So, and the, uh, th th there, was a, there was a discussion about the Hiroshima AI process for the AI, and also the we have the IAP, the Hiroshima AI is HAP, and the IAP is Institutional Arrangement for Partnership, as regarding the DFFT, Data Free Flow with, with Trust. So, uh, as a, a, a private sector in Japan, we highly support this HAP and IAP together. And more importantly, HAP and IAP is so the both sides of the coin. So it's it's hardly linked. So without a data free data free flow, we can do a uh, little thing. Uh, we can we can little do little things about the AI development, and the users of the AI will suffer from the the, the utilization of the technology. So that's very important. And the AI can do uh, something about the, the what in, in the issue in the data. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, someone talked about the younger generation production. So the misinformation and disinformation generated by AI, artificial intelligence, the fake news is a, uh, the big problem in protecting the younger generation. So uh, this, uh, that, that's why, that I, as, as I mentioned, this, this is both sides of the coin, so highly related. So the next thing I, I want to talk about is uh, why we need the data governance in free flow of data. <coughs> so, and the, uh, this is a fundamental question for business. Why do we need the data free flow with trust? It's a it's a you know, big big question, and the, nobody can answer very fluently about that. But it it is very important. So uh, and the uh, yes, the data governance uh, can help uh, to protect human rights, as you said, and the uh, in cyberspace and personal data protection and intellectual property, and digital identity and digital assets like the uh, the crypto crypt coins and many other things and regardless and where whether there is a uh, uh, intent of uh, the uh, it is very important for us to think about how we can tackle with these uh, problems so and some of what we can do for them is tangible and the rest of uh, needs to be more deeply discussion so, uh, for, for example, the uh, things, uh, standardization, you talked about that, and also the harmonization and the interoperability um, regarding the data governance is very, very essential. That is what we see right now. But there's much more what we don't see right now. So uh, we, have to, uh, we have to coordinate all of the issues about this. The second thing and the, uh, is the, the what data governance means for private sector. So uh, data governance is essential, essential for the private sector benefit. But I talked about it, that, that, will, that will mitigate the cost and risk. It's a very important one. But what is more about that? 
So uh, it will affect uh, the revenue of private sector, a single company. There is a very good um, uh, example in, in the ASEAN company, so uh, the telecom company. Uh, when uh, they they just uh, cut, uh, they just uh, uh, decreased the, the the control of the data flows, so the, the revenue popped up very much. So uh, that is a, a kind of the Netflix and and the uh, the uh, that uh, contents delivery services. So that always affect the uh, the revenue of the uh, the companies directly, but there will be the indirect. Uh, effect to uh, the business and we, we are not uh, uh, we, are, we are not still uh, aware of so that is a very important one for to discuss about that so and uh, thus, uh, I, I want to emphasize that the, the, the importance of the trust in the data driven economy so that's why I raised the word uh, the economy of trust here in this session so, and um, I will uh, I'll spend uh, a second for the, uh, the ICC, the Digital Economy Commission's work, which will include uh, the white paper on the government access to data held by the private sector. So uh, maybe uh, Timea can provide uh, the hard copy or, 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 or link to that uh, the, the great uh, report. And also the we are preparing the, the non-personal non data report uh, soon. So uh, these will uh, they will consist of the uh, many many uh <coughs> principles or items for to for the consideration. So uh, I would I recommend you to visit uh, ICC's uh, website to to uh, to see what is discussed here in this pri private se private sectors. So uh, that's me. I will stop Thank here. You. So Thank you, Mike. yeah, back to. Yeah. And thank you for the shout out for ICC's work. And, and I do want to thank you some, uh, to some of the panelists that uh, I know they, they have to leave. So thank you so much for those of you who need to step out. Please feel free to do so. We will continue. Um, and f f for those of you who are interested in the ICC work, please pass by our booth. There's a QR code you can scan and you'll find all of our papers there. Um, uh, we're very happy to have a uh, chat with you about what, what's in them. But I want to uh, open this conversation up now to, to the rest uh, of you in the room and around this table. And there's some free seats, so feel free to come up and sit um, and, and, and ask any questions that you would like or maybe share any um, ideas on how you see um, data free flows with trust. How do you see responsible data governance at international, at national, and in between? Any? David, please. Uh, can we get a microphone there? <laughs> Thank you. I, I guess the microphone was the better option. Um, and sorry, we, we, we've, we've talked about this session for a while, and I think I'll throw up the softball. I mean, I think one of the, the issues, and similar, probably will come up somewhat in my presentation, um, is, a, is a bit of uh, ideological um, contradictions. We have sort of different ways of looking at this issue, and I guess maybe Miko's the question really is, we talk about data free flow with trust. I mean, there is an alternative um, narrative out there about the uh, value of data localization, and it's not necessarily uh, w one or the other, but I mean, it does have impacts uh, um, a bit earlier to um, Renata's comments about um, the inherent strategic value of data. And, and I guess I was just curious, perhaps, to bring the two together. Um, what is DFFT, so the free flow of data, um, value prospect, say, versus the data lo localization value prospect, and what are the sort of pros and cons? And either of you would like to take that question? Matt, please, we can get a microphone there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the great qu question, and the, uh, well, that's a big question for us, and the, uh, well, this is not, uh, there is no uh, silver bullet here, but the actually we are facing the many, many barriers. So uh, that will hinder the data free flow or uh, data utilization, it is, is a fact. So the, uh, in the IAP, we are going to uh, cultivate uh, the, the what is the situation for the, uh, the data governance on the data legislation. 
So first things we have to do is to uh, have a common <coughs> view about the, what is the problem in this arena. So maybe and we can think about it, the some standards and then uh, we can uh, we can think about the next step and the uh, the cultivate the, the common business arena um, environment for the for the future. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Renata. Would you like to? Thank you, Mike. Well, um, it's a good question and a difficult to answer because maybe there is some contradiction and maybe there is not. I think. It's completely um, um, legitimate that um, nations want to have this their own uh, da data centers, their their own structures and infrastructures to develop it their own um, solutions and to do this without uh, um, uh, depend, uh, without a dependence from uh, the uh, countries and uh, companies that today uh, concentrate the large volu volume of that data. But uh, this is not a problem because I think this can be done and we have the other uh, without um, without um, uh, stopping uh, the free flow of data w where this data is necessary to um, uh, international and uh, a common uh, use of data. So I don't think there is a big, big, big contradiction. But there is some because there are uh, economic interests involved, and we have to face it. And we have to maybe the way to mitigate this apparently con uh, uh, contradiction is with uh, regulatory framework frameworks to address how the free flow of data when this free flow is important for the international and the needs of society is uh, uh, um, have to be done and uh, how kind of data we have to protect and is strategic, is strategic, is strategic for the sovereignty of the countries. So I think uh, maybe uh, we can uh, face these problems with uh, a discussion a uh, mature discussion and a regulatory framework, but it's important to build uh, uh, our own uh, infrastructure because this is uh, a strategy for sovereignty and for uh, more uh, independence in all the economic chain of digital society. Thank you. Um, I'll let you keep that because I'm going to turn to a question uh, back <laughs> in, in a second to all of you, so I'll let you keep that microphone. But since uh, this is a session by ICC, I, I won't feel too badly for plugging in another <laughs> ICC uh, uh, paper on this if you go to our websites. Um, there was actually an interesting report produced by my colleagues in our trade division uh, that looks at um, the development impact of, of data flows uh, versus develop the um, uh, development impact of uh, data localization and, and try to address this question that you asked, David, whether uh, or not there is um, how much is to gain from either or, uh, and is this really uh, an either or uh, situation, um, uh, and do we need to choose, or, or how are we looking at um, uh, benefiting uh, from what data has to offer when it is shared and flowing across borders. So um, I'm not going to uh, share everything in that paper, but please go to the ICC website and you will find it there. If you don't, um, send me a, a quick message and I'll send it to you um, just for another uh, extra perspective on, on this matter. But I'm going to turn back to the panel and ask you uh, for your takeaways and lessons that we should bring from everything that you've shared here in, as we're looking into global um, mechanisms to govern um, data? What is it that we have learned uh, so far and what can the IGF take forward into uh, international spaces in this? Oh, well, 
I don't know. <laughs> it's a very important question too. I think we have to uh, strengthen the approach of multi-stakeholder uh, governance because um, it's uh, a wise way to um, construction the best, the better um, governance for the um, not the uh, only the protection of human rights but also to face the data governance as uh, an element of all this discussion about AI, uh, AI and other uses of our data. So I think the IGF maybe needs to strengthen this uh, approach with um, more um, contribution from the academic field, because I think the um, uh, university and uh, all the knowledge they are developing in this area is very important, and maybe uh, give us some highlights in how to face the new challenges. I don't know, uh, but uh, I think this is a, a way that we can uh, go for it. More of the stakeholder contributions to, to global policy processes. I think that's a very strong message uh, to take to take forward. Thank you for that, Renata. Uh, Mac, what are your takeaways from um, from the discussion that we can learn? Thank you so much. And I, I should be quite uh, brief. And well, uh, everything has uh, spoken by the uh, the Mr. Miele and the many others. So, uh, well, just one thing. Uh, you just emphasized the, the linkage to the trade policies. Mm. So, well, uh, that's, that's what I didn't touch upon, but the, this is very, very important to uh, think about it because the trade negotiation, trade rules uh, really affect the private sector's business. So uh, the free flow uh, is also discussed in the, the context of the APEX and trade rules or, or WTO, e-commerce, uh, JSI, uh, which is Joint Statement Initiative, mm -hmm. and the also the uh, we will talk about the the, uh, and the, 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 uh, the, the moratorium about the, the e-commerce taxation. So those sort of the things uh, will be the very very important for us. So this is highly related to the uh, the trade uh, data governance issues. So and the, the real arena for us to uh, send our voices. So that's uh, something, and we uh, I had in in my impression. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mac, for that. Um, so pair multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships with uh, holistic considerations of the policy space when we think about data. Um, I, I think those were two um, great uh, great takeaways from the discussion. Um, I'm going to step back from from these uh, very hot topics and take us back a little bit to the basics. Um, where everything starts when we talk about internet and digital policy, uh, which is getting people connected, um, uh, getting people online, um, and making sure that that online presence and connectivity um, responds to the needs um, and, and responds to um, uh, really of why uh, we call a connection meaningful, uh, that those who do go online find uh, what they were looking for when they're there um, and find opportunities um, to further their own personal development, but our development collectively as societies. Um, so to kick us off, I'm going to um, ask David to um, maybe share a couple of uh, prospects from um, Canada's perspective um, on how you look at connectivity, uh, the connectivity policy agenda, both in the um, uh, light of the processes that we've been discussing here, G7, G20, and others, but also taking us looking ahead uh, into um, the policy processes that are just starting up, such as the OSS Plus 20, the Global Digital Compact, and others. So David, please. Thank you, Tamia, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, David Fairchild from the Canadian Mission in uh, Geneva, First Secretary. Um, I guess we call this in the, the fourth in the lineup, I'm the cleanup batter. Um, Tamia asked me to do a bit of a sort of horizon scan, uh, mosaic. Uh, my job is horizontal. And so I have my fingers in many pies, uh, whether it be cyber, digital, and tech related. 
um, it's purposely done this way and so that uh, we can start to identify um, connective tissue between different multilateral um, processes. And I think that's it's an important function because um, the bottom line up front uh, for me, so the, the punchline to the story really is um, at the global stage now, we're, we're faced with both a horizontal expansion um, of the debate, but also ver increasing vertical entanglement of the issues. And I sort of, I, I describe it as a T. Um, the, the vertical is the governance, the horizontal is the policy application issues. And I think uh, between cyber, digital, and tech, uh, each one is at different levels of maturity. But what we're seeing is uh, a lot of dilettantes and neophytes having to jump into this conversation um, with varying levels of understanding. And, and I think that uh, is both a benefit because I think sometimes fresh eyes is a great um, way to review perhaps long-standing issues, but it also does uh, increase the risks that we end up down uh, policy tracks and conversations that really fail to misunderstand perhaps some of the substantive uh, background. So, and I think the other thing, reality, is I've only been doing this for two years, so my, my knowledge base uh, isn't as deep as, unfortunately, some people in this room um, who've been here since the beginning. And, and so it's fair also to assume that the political context in 2003, the political context of 2013, and the political context of 2023 may be very different, um, but also probably very similar. And of course, for the old timers, uh, maybe a little more gray and a little longer in the tooth, but I think a lot of them tend to say it's the same conversations about the same issues, it's just that it's happening in a different way. Um, so, 2003, uh, we didn't have Google and we didn't have Facebook, uh, but thankfully we also didn't have cat videos. Um, today, <laughs> all of those things are an ubiquitous part of our daily lives. Um, yeah, so I won't really go through the long history, but I think it's really important to understand the foundations of what is the IGF, what is WISIS, um, because really for Canada, like many countries, it is the premise on a, in a strong multi-stakeholder environment. And I've said this before, and I firmly believe this, the DNA of this ecosystem is equal partners. Uh, we don't ha the internet is not owned by member states. Um, it is p you know, part and parcel. The private sector today has a very strong role in providing security to member states in terms of their, their on, uh, online services and GovStack. So we are in a very different policy space, um, but unfortunately, of course, the reality is the UN is 80 years old, almost. And so is an analog system trying to now deal with, in a way, some digital problems. Um, it's a, a constant issue and, and one I think that we're, we're struggling to deal with um, in this current climate and I'll sort of fast forward quickly because I, I can spend as long as you give me talking and, and I, I apologize for that. I tried to frame this in the last years as the drive to 2025 and because I sit in multiple <coughs> buckets, um, there is a concerted or has been a concerted effort uh, to get to, to a culmination point in 2025 on a number of processes um, that has been engineered uh, that way. Uh, whether it be in the cyber context, we can look at first committee open-ended working group, we can look at the GG, uh, GGE on lethal autonomous weapons systems, we can look at outer space. Um, there are concerted efforts to drive uh, agendas forward to a very specific time. 2025, of course, we all know, is a very important year in the digital ecosystem with the WISIS plus 20. Uh, we can look into the digital ecosystem, of course, and that has, we did have WISIS plus 20, we have IGF plus 10 coming up in 2025, and then we got a new kid on the block which suddenly popped on the radar, which was the, co the um, roadmap to digital cooperation, which became the common agenda, which has become the summit of the future. And while we've uh, spent a lot of time fascinating on the global digital compact, I posit that there are other elements to the future summit that need paying attention to. The new agenda for peace, the outer space, and info integrity are, are sort of critical elements that deal with parts of the policies, a AI being one of them, but certainly cyber and emerging tech as both um, uh, something that's gonna provide benefit, but also has risks to it. And I think the sec gen was very clear the UN needs to be fit for purpose, and what it needs to be fit for purpose for is the 21st century, which is going to be a digitalized century. 
And I think this goes back to the origins of what is WISIS. It's about getting to the point where we have achieved the information society. So I think in 2003 we got it right, but the context in 2023 is totally different for those conversations. We're doing well on time? Okay. Um, what is happening now, and I think the, the core issue, I think, for a lot of member states is, of course, this new context to this conversation is being layered onto very old fault lines and lines in the sand. And we know very well IG has been a long-standing issue between different countries, different blocks, and different ideologies. And I, I won't name them, but I mean, if you were to look at the DFI and what really is the grounding um, statement in the declaration, and I pulled it up just to make sure I don't make a mistake, um, differs very much from others. You know, we have two very different ideological expressions of what is the what is internet governance, what is the internet, and how we should how member states should or should not be in control of it. That isn't going hasn't gone away and is only being um, further stressed as things like AI become uh, even more pressing policy questions. And I think, without naming any member states, without naming anybody in the room, I think we all can understand from a member state's perspective, uh, not necessarily those who are very clear on which side of the fence they sit on. For many countries, they're stuck in the middle um, and trying to figure out wh where they, this is all going to land and how this is or isn't going to be beneficial for themselves. And so the policy choices member states are having to make are certainly being affected by the international. Um, well, I had a lot more in here, but I think I'm running out of time. I think the next bound for me is then the push to 2030. We just finished the SDG summit. I think we all very clearly now understand that one of the failures of the SDG is that it never really accounted for the digital environment, which is what the WISIS action lines are. So the SDG summit this year, the high level week, we saw a lot of references to connectivity, to digital development. And if you listen to uh, ambassadors and uh, senior officials, you are seeing a clear demand from a growing majority of member states for help. They, they are sensing that they are falling behind in what is the next uh, industrial revolution, whether it be the digital or the data um, economy. 2030, for me, obviously, is the culmination point for the 2030 agenda, the, uh, hopefully the completion and success uh, of the SDG goals, but it's also really the next inflection point from a governance standpoint. And so I, we are certainly caught in a two-year period right now where we have to get to 2025 and make some very clear decisions, um, but I think that needs to be framed a f little bit further out and looking into 2030 and what is the next bound after that. And so the decisions of tomorrow, today, need to be looking at the decisions and how they affect the tomorrow. Um, I think I'll stop there. I probably chewed into more of my five minutes, but I'm happy to take any question. <laughs> Thank you, Thank David. You. Thank you for setting up um, this really historical context of why we are discussing digital policy and, and, and how are we discussing digital policy, not just for the sake of discussing digital now, but as you said, uh, in, in a context of much broader policy conversations, uh, much broader conversations about the future of our societies and our, and our environment um, and, uh, and our economic future as well. Um, so the, the top and bottom of this is, is really that making sure that everyone everywhere gets connected. Um, that's the reason of all this policy conversation. Uh, why, but also, what for? So um, to unpack some of this, um, I, I have um, Alessandro Gropelli from the European Telecommunication Networks um, Operators Association online. Alessandro, are you with us? Good morning from Brussels. You hear me well? All fine? Yes, we can hear you well. We cannot see you on the screen, but I hope we can see you very soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, I would ask you uh, to maybe share um, your taking stock um, uh, of private sector uh, efforts uh, of how we connect the unconnected and how we provide some of this um, digital um, infrastructure uh, and, and opportunities for everyone to connect that, as I said, is the top and bottom of all these digital policy conversations. Um, the floor is yours and we hope to see you soon on the screen. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll try to have an imposing voice then at least. and. Uh, <laughs> I've been following your discussions. Well, first of all, I'm very 
Jealous you're all in Kyoto, one of the most beautiful places in the world. So, ohayou gozaimasu to the uh, Japanese uh, friends. Uh, here, I'm still uh, um, on morning time. Um, so, Alessandro Grappelli from Etno, the European Telecom Associations. Uh, we represent the main telecom operators uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, so the perspective that we take is the perspective of those who actually build the internet uh, and the internet infrastructure, if you wish. Uh, as you said, uh, before you can go online, before you are included in what uh, uh, the internet offers in terms of opportunities, uh, there is a lot of phone masts to build. Uh, there is a lot of streets to cover with the uh, fixed networks. In our case in Europe right now, it's about bringing fiber to the home. And we are up for a pretty historic uh, challenge here in the EU, which is covering over 450 million people with 5G, so the latest generation of mobile communications, and with fiber to the home. Uh, this brings me to how do we look at that um, when it is about building the basics of the internet, building the plumbing and the infrastructure uh, on which you can have an open internet. It's about investment. And this is the core of the debate right now in Europe, but also in the United States, uh, in, in Asia, and in many countries uh, at different times of uh, at different types of speeds, at different types of legacy infrastructure. But the big question is uh, finding the money to invest. To give you an idea of the magnitude, the European telecom sector over the past 10 years has invested 500 billion euros in networks. Going ahead, if I zoom in on the EU, there are recent estimates from the European Commission published just uh, 10 days ago uh, that says that in order to achieve this uh, dream, this vision of full 5G and full fiber for our citizens, uh, what, we're, what we're looking at is an effort of an extra 227 billion. Um, what is it about? It's about, of course, um, the rollout, but it's about inclusion, most importantly. We have done some uh, projections with Analysis Mason, and if we keep on investing at the current pace in the EU in, 2020, in 2030, we will have around 10% of the population, which will be left out of gigabit connectivity. That's 45 million people. And of course, from a European perspective, that's absolutely unacceptable. It's about inclusion, but it's also about sustainability. Uh, one of the big debates right now in the EU is how do you implement the European Green Deal? How do you make sure that manufacturing companies, transport companies, public services, develop in a way uh, that they review uh, the way in which they produce and they interact and they become less carbon intensive. Clearly, digitization and the use of digital tool has a major role in this, which is why uh, here they call it the twin digital and green transition. They go together. And if you don't have those networks uh, deployed in an inclusive way, then you don't get there. So it's about also the achievement ultimately of the sustainable development goals in uh, UN speak, if you wish. Now, regulation uh, is the next step. So we spoke about rollout, we spoke about the investment effort uh, and what that means for an industry like ours. The rules of the game, the rules at which telecom operators can deploy this network and interact with other people in the ecosystem, of course, uh, create a delicate chemistry that can either stimulate that investment environment to ensure inclusion and rollout for inclusion, or it can uh, basically hamper it. And there are different uh, areas or different dimensions that you can look at. Uh, and from a European perspective, I will bring you a bit what are the uh, learning points also in terms of policy of what can help and what uh, doesn't help instead. Uh, 
the first one is the cost of rollout. Uh, there is right now a debate uh, that keeps uh, busy all of the <laughs> EU institutions on finalizing uh, the so-called Gigabit Infrastructure Act. It's uh, a regulation that hopefully, if and when approved, will help uh, public authorities at the national and local level to reduce the cost of rollout. We realize that as we cover those streets, street by street, uh, for uh, fiber to the home, as we put up those uh, phone masts uh, to keep to get the mobile coverage out there, there is a lot of uh, small um, hurdles uh, to doing that. And they have to do with red tape, with permits, with the length of these permits, with the coordination of works between um, different utilities. And uh, the EU is right now looking into lowering those uh, barriers, uh, if you wish. So that is about the cost of rolling out. But then there is a matter also of how markets are geared. One big problem that we have right now at the European level is the lack of a genuine telecom single market. We are 27 member states, uh, but the issue is that our telecoms markets are still very fragmented across national lines. This makes it that for 440 million people, we have over 100 uh, mobile operators, while some global peers, like in the US, you have three or four and so on. And of course, the scale at which telecom operators can work impacts their ability to put out that investment. We were discussing it before, 227 billion missing for the EU digital decade target. So one big question is where do you find that money in a sector that right now is very fragmented and very often is uh, working uh, uh, below the cost uh, of capital. The third area beyond uh, how uh, your sector is shaped in terms of uh, market dynamics and number of uh, players uh, is of course the relationship between the different players in the internet value chain and how value is distributed inside uh, the internet value chain. I will not go in detail here, uh, but of course the discussion on how uh, we distribute the value and how we monetize uh, the investment after we rolled out network is intimately linked uh, to our capacity to invest uh, in uh, first place. Last aspect that I would like to cover is more from a technology viewpoint. So what are we seeing happening across the world and in the EU, especially when it comes to the evolution on the use of our networks? And one very interesting thing that links to the first two parts of, of the discussion that we got today is that we are starting to look how uh, uh, the data growth will evolve in the next 10 years, in the next decade. And right now we can estimate that we will have a data growth of around 25% on European networks, both mobile and uh, fixed. It's an important growth, it's sustained, but it's not um, a shocking number. A big open question is, what about these trends that you discussed earlier from the metaverse to AI? AI, uh, of course, implies also AI-generated content. At the beginning, it was text. Now it's more and more videos. And VR and AR, there were some important announcements by global players on launching VR headsets that might become very famous. So right now, there is an open question as uh, uh, to how these big trends will create opportunities or risk and threats for telecom operators uh, as the data usage evolves and maybe it becomes less human and less controllable by humans and it becomes more AI generated. So that's how we are looking at the challenge from the perspective of European telecom operators. Thank you. Thank you for that very comprehensive overview. That was quite a lot of information packed into, uh, into that presentation, but a lot of food for thought. Um, and if I can, again, um, live with my right as moderator to plug in a, um, a policy product from ICC, uh, our um, white paper on delivering universal meaningful connectivity really speaks to the heart of the matter uh, that, you, that you raised here, is how do we find innovative um, 
financial, technological, and regulatory solutions to advance uh, connectivity um, that is responsive also to the ecosystem view that we see when we look at the internet, that brings together elements that you've mentioned, the infrastructure, the services and content that drives that infrastructure and the willingness to connect, and then of course, how do we look into the skills um, and, and the ability of users to use that infrastructure, to use those services and content, create them themselves, and participate truly in, in this uh, global um, digital economy and the internet that we have. So to talk a little bit about those um, ideas and take, uh, take stock of the private sector efforts from a different part of the industry, uh, but um, a very uh, important part of the industry, uh, I'm going to turn to, to Thomas uh, Vollmer from Netflix, uh, and I will have to thank you for your patience. Somebody has to go last, and you've been very, very gracious uh, in giving us your time, listening to everyone uh, who spoke before you. So we're very eager to hear from you. Um, we need a microphone here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, connectivity. Uh, such uh, an important part of all our lives. Uh, spoiler alert, Netflix is not in the connectivity business. <laughs> yet, as you said, we are here today. I think I, I, I respect Alessandro's dedication to be up on a Sunday morning. I'm still on Paris time myself, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a long day. Uh, but why are we here? Is it is because content, like what the one Netflix produces and distributes, and connectivity have a mutual dependency. So if we think about the old world of telecoms, um, you would purchase a package of a pipe and then a service, pay for the minute, and they would be bundled. And in the old world of TV, you would purchase a, uh, a bundle of a cable pipe and then content, TV channels, and they would be bundled. And for consumers, it sucked because you didn't get the choice. The open internet completely revolutionized this model for the past, let's say, quarter of a quarter of a century, let's say, give or take. Uh, what it allows us to do is the connectivity sector to compete and invest in connectivity in networks, and the content or services sector to compete and invest in content or services. Uh, Alessandro talked before me about the massive investments that go into competing networks for, for connectivity, so I don't need to elaborate on this. And, on the, and then on the content side as well, I'm sure you're all familiar with the so-called streaming wars. It's an extremely competitive business as well. Uh, and Netflix, uh, for our share, invest 50% of our revenue back into content every year, producing new shows, new movies all around the world to please our members. And also drive the demand for the networks and the services and the investment. So we see this kind of virtuous uh, circle that benefits competition for an investment for content, competition and investment for networks, and in the end, choice and freedom of choice and affordability for consumers and end users. And this is this virtual circle of the open internet that we hope, as the private sector, that the IG organizations like the IGF and regulators will continue to foster um, and promote. And promote. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you for thank you for that. Um, and it is a, a push and pull uh, uh, and a driver uh, of this of this connectivity, as you said, this the circle. Um, are there any reactions uh, to some of what we've heard um, from David, uh, Alessandro, and, and Thomas on, on, on this um, mosaic, as as you you uh, you said, David, of, of different policy considerations on on connectivity? The remaining panelists or anybody from the room, the floor is open. David, you wanted to add something else? We need a microphone over there, please. Nobody likes dead air. It's interesting, uh, very fascinating, because uh, if you're in Somalia, what you just said has almost no meaning uh, in terms of connectivity. And so the complexities of the problem is that on, on, a, on a sliding scale of connectivity issues, uh, at the very high end, which is, you know, uh, in the more advanced parts of the world, there are really complex and complicated policy problems, um, but that is on a sort of uh, f distant future from s for 2.6 billion uh, people who have zero connectivity. And so the complexity of the policy space is 
uh, this is all, you know, unfortunately, as what's the Oscar winning movie? It's everything all the time, all at once, whatever it is. It's, uh, and what it, it's playing out in the dialogue uh, at the multilateral level, countries who have the same rights, the same voice, the same interests, or different interests, but the same voice and are at the same form. So we are essentially talking about the same words, using the same words, but with very different meaning and very different intent. And I think this is what is different in 2023 is I think a lot of the global majority and the, a lot of the you know G77, the, the different, the non-first world part of the globe are beginning to realize that they need certain things that the processes are not delivering. And I think that's become more evident as the years have gone on. Thomas, please. Uh. <laughs> Thank you for the collaborative spirit on the panel. <laughs> yes. No, thank you, David. I think that's, I think what you're touching upon is the, of course, the, the, the so-called digital divide. I mean, of course, there's a kind of hierarchy of needs, right? And a pyramid of Maslow. So, of course, uh, certainly in a place like Somalia, access to movies and TV shows and pay TV, probably not the first priority. Um, I do want maybe to, um, illustrate a couple of things uh, that Netflix has been is, is doing, uh, maybe in different markets, and some examples. I think today, in fact, um, hearing from some of the experiences around the world in Japan and in uh, in Brazil and India, I think can 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 teach us a thing or two as well, and then maybe elaborating on the framework that uh, Alessandro kind of suggested. I think we're talking about coverage uh, for next generation networks. Adoption is equally important. Um, I think Europe is on track to get to 90% fiber coverage by 2030. It's an amazing achievement. Yet one in two households in Europe actually subscribe to fiber. For me, as a tech enthusiast, I find it amazing that someone can get fiber and chooses not to, but it exists. It's a fact. And so clearly, on that end of the market, um, the um, let's say the investment in content, driving the demand, driving adoption, is the driver specifically for investors? They look at they look at how homes passed. They look at the ad 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 adoption rate, and that's the revenue they factor in for their investment. So it's a it's a really really critical piece of the of the puzzle. And then maybe uh, to touch upon uh, the more hard to reach areas, and uh, also the theme of uh, efficiency and sustainability uh, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, I think the infrastructure of the internet and interconnections on the inter on the internet have proven extremely resilient and efficient at the same time so if i take brazil as an example and we have uh, uh, renata around the table here today ixbr in sao paulo is the largest internet exchange point in the world there are dozens of locations all around brazil um, that exchange traffic locally and this has enabled a, genera uh, 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 um, a swarm, I don't know if that's the proper word, of small ISPs that compete for connecting people in the harder to reach areas. Uh, humbly, uh, we do our part. Uh, Netflix has a program called Open Connect where we store content locally so that when people press play, the video comes from right around the corner. It's better quality, it's less network cost, it's better performance for the end users. Uh, and I think in Brazil alone, we have over a thousand caching locations in the country, uh, in all those various locations, uh, helping to drive adoption of those networks. I I'll take just a couple of examples from, uh, from today. Uh, I think on either side of, uh, let's say, development, uh, Japan on track to get to I, I think I hear well, 99.9, .9, very high speed uh, broadband uh, coverage. Uh, and, and, and they laid out their roadmap really clearly, you know. Uh, competition, stimulating investment, uh, and then looking at the demand side. That's really kind of the, 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 the winning team here. And of course, smart policies around telecoms, around spectrum allocation, subsidies, or universal service. Uh, and then India, in the past decade, TRI has reported that the share of data services in uh, ISP or, or in MNO revenue has uh, multiplied by 10, went from 8% to over 80%. So now over 80% 80 of mobile revenue is just data. And this has created almost a doubling of revenues for MNOs in the past 10 years uh, and uh, multiplying the amount of people in India that have access to the internet by four. So you see a number of success stories 
and the levers that they have used, this competition, this driving of the demand, the smart policies around spectrum subsidies, etc. So I think there's a huge task. There are big numbers of dollars, but the recipes are known because we see it. Uh, we have seen the Indian experience, the Brazilian experience, the Japanese experience, and, and, and Europe as well, of course. Uh, if Europe is on track to be at 90% by 2030, they're already on track uh, at for 90% for 90 in Spain, in Lithuania, I was hearing earlier this morning. So the recipes are well known, and so I think continuing in that track, continuing in preserving the open internet is what is going to uh, get us there. Thank you. Um, Can I maybe yes. lo loop in from... Sure, from sure. this one, Brussels. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Alexander. And maybe my, my comments here are, are of two uh, types. Um, I think the, the point that David brought up is very important. And um, I know that many of our members, for example, as, are also active in the African continent, for example, and they are working there to, to bring out the connectivity. Uh, of course, the premise is different because there is no legacy networks in many cases. And legacy networks are a curse and they are a blessing. Uh, of course, they are a blessing because, for example, in Europe right now, we already have a very good internet uh, that reaches everybody to the point that, as Thomas said, um, many people are just happy with what they have and they don't see the value of shifting to fiber. On the other hand, they are a curse because when you have a legacy thing, you need to uh, change it and you need to ditch it and you need to build something new. So uh, sometimes it's easier to build it from scratch than uh, to uh, reform something uh, old. And this links also to the regulatory framework. And I think it could be also important for other areas of the world to learn about the good aspects of the European regulatory framework and of its limitations. One of the big issues we have right now in Europe is that we are still promoting that competition based on the old networks which is basically a price competition to push down retail prices. But on the other hand, we would like to have those operators who are investing in fiber to make money out of their big, big uh, 227 billion investment. And if they have return of investment, they will invest faster, which is the reason why right now we have, as uh, also Thomas was saying, 90% covered, but 45 million people that virtually in 2030 will not have access uh, to that fiber, which means roughly four times and a half the size of Portugal, which is, of course, from, from our perspective, not ideal and not where we want to be. And so now there will be reflections on, on how uh, uh, hopefully uh, fix uh, that, uh, that uh, gap and that shortcoming. The second uh, consideration very fast is reverse innovation. Uh, by being present in many um, uh, countries outside the EU, we see that our operators very often get inspired uh, by what happens in these countries and then bring it back to the EU. One very good example is uh, mobile payments. Mobile payments were born first with M-Pesa uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Central Africa, and then our operators brought them back in Europe, again, there in Europe, we have this big infrastructure of the banking system, while uh, M-Pesa was built uh, to respond to the need of uh, uh, bypassing the, the lack of penetration of the banking system. But then we found out that it could be attractive and interesting also in Europe, and we brought it back. So these were my two points on David's uh, uh, angle, which I think is extremely important, especially in the context in which you are now. Grazie, Alessandro. Um, so I'm going to uh, give an opportunity to, for Renata to, to react as, as, as we um, uh, heard from uh, Thomas on, on Brazil. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, mentioning our um, ECHIS uh, uh, project that uh, we are very proud of <laughs> because it's a way to contribute to the resilience and the internet in Brazil. But uh, I also want to say that um, I think we have, certainly we have a very, very big challenge when we discussing uh, the, how to 
to make policies to connect people in a meaningful way because we know that we are very, very big asymmetries and we have to face it. But I think um, the answer is uh, there is no one, no, not only one one's answer. There are a lot of uh, um, initiatives, uh, public initiatives, um, uh, private initiatives, and community initiatives like uh, uh, networks, uh, community networks, and other things that we can uh, do to uh, to uh, spread the connection and, and diminish the the inequalities in this way. I don't think we have to. We have. I don't think it's easy to do, but uh, in our in Brazil with this project that connects uh, the, 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 the contents uh, all around the country, uh, we are trying to contribute with this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Arata. Um, I believe you had a question, uh, and thank you. Thank you for the microphone. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, just two quick points. Um, w w one is with uh, try to balance the competing interests in some ways of the uh, sort of the network operators and the uh, content providers. Uh, I, I think one of the challenges for the network operators is there's limited, sometimes no, revenue upside when more content is consumed, but there is a cost implication from having to constantly upgrade the back-end infrastructure. Um, so I can see why... It I guess the uh, uh, telecoms operators would f feel the need to try and recover that cost uh, from the people that are effectively imposing the cost um, on them. And I'm sort of neutral uh, in, in, in this debate, but I can sort of empathize with them. The, the other challenge for the, uh, from an inclusion point of view when dealing with the, the, the excluded, um, often that would be a project that will be taken on, say, by governments, to subsidize the, uh, the, the rollout. Again, one of the challenges, and, and this is not a Netflix point for the avoidance of doubt, uh, is many of the tech companies um, uh, uh, very aggressively engage in, in tax avoidance. Um, and that means in many of the countries where they operate, the, the, the funds that traditionally would have been available to help uh, sort of pay for the subsidy just aren't there. Uh, because the, uh, the the money's been extracted from the market, but it's going to other countries um, b because of the tax avoidance policies. So I think those are two sort of challenges that n that, that need to be thought about if there's going to be a sustainable infrastructure over the long term. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for sharing those perspectives. And I think what we can take away from this conversation is um, when we look into financing connectivity, we need to make sure that um, we understand how the private sector makes investment decisions across the ecosystem. Um, and we cannot deal with these in, in silos, or, or not, not in policy silos, not in sectoral silos, but we need to be able to look at the ecosystem uh, and the complexity of how it works within and across borders um, to be able to, to drive those uh, investment decisions and incentivize those in investment decisions that we do need um, uh, to, um, to connect the unconnected, to reconnect the disconnected, and to provide uh, incentives for those who are covered but unconnected to make sure that they, they get online and can benefit with everything that that, um, that has to offer, uh, both from a personal and economic development perspective. Um, and I do think that that requires uh, much of what we shared here before, a multi-stakeholder collaboration and a cross-ecosystem um, collaboration um, and incentivizing cooperation. So um, I, I hope we can we can leave this at that. We have um, about eight minutes left in our session. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, our panelists uh, to share their, their final takeaways um, from their own panels, but also uh, from the conversation that we've had and everything that, that was shared around the, around the room. Um, and I'm going to ask first the, the panelists of the, of the last group, and then we're going to work backwards. Um, so, um, Alessandro, can I start with you to share your one-minute final takeaway? Yeah, sure, sure. So, my 
takeaway is that we are all in the same ecosystem. Uh, we are all dependent on each other. Uh, our users, uh, first of all, uh, that need uh, networks to be out there. And uh, secondly, we telecom operators who are effectively building the internet street by street, phone mast by phone mast, and the others in the ecosystem, the tech companies, uh, the streamers, we are all together into this uh, big challenge. And we need to ensure that this ecosystem works in a sustainable way, that things are balanced, uh, and that the incentives for each of us uh, in terms of investing and uh, bringing out uh, these new networks in an inclusive matter are there and that they are effective and that they work in an harmonious way. This said, we need international fora like this one to learn from each other and uh, we need to do it via a multi-stakeholder model. So that's something that I didn't have the opportunity to say before, but Ethno is a long-standing supporter of the multi-stakeholder uh, model. We believe in it, we promote it. We have people like our director general who were part of shaping it and creating it. So I think that my closing line should be, let's keep up uh, the good work and let's keep the multi-stakeholder model strong. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, Thomas, can you have a microphone here, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, very much reinforced the, uh, the, the, the in looking at the industry as a whole with the mutual dependency and, and, and the content on one side, the connectivity on the other. Uh, kind of uh, benefiting for each other and being on the same boat. I think this forums like this are particularly important to have this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder um, approach. I think we see the virtual circle in action with the examples I have given, you know, this uh, India, Japan, Brazil. I think there was a question, a concern like, oh, is there a, a, a downside to the growth in demand for internet connections? Uh, I think in the past decade, tra internet traffic has grown over tenfold. In the decade before that, over tenfold again. That's over a hundred times. The cost of networks keep going down, down, down. And so I think it's thanks to this collaboration, thanks to these efficiencies, that you keep seeing those high traffic growth, high demand growth, and then improving results all along the value chain. Thank you. Um, David. Can we ask for one minute takeaway from the conversation? <laughs> I will be nice. Um, I'm just going to read two things. Sorry, I was sort of perusing the internet. These are not my words, but these are words that are available publicly. Right? Jointly support the establishment of an equitable and transparent interstate system of internet governance while preserving the rights, sovereign right of states to regulate national segments of the global network. Contrast that with the DFI event, if those who attended it this morning, just to give you an idea, these are very old uh, issues. Um, they are becoming uh, more important and hotter uh, in the current environment. I think they have been in a very long time. And I think, and unfortunately, member states and all stakeholders have a part to play in this conversation. And I think for Canada, we certainly want to walk the talk on what we call meaningful uh, stakeholder involvement. Thank you. That's a very strong uh, support statement there for the multi-stakeholder model that all of you have been echoing. Um, Renata, can I ask you for your final one-minute takeaway? <laughs> okay. Just a thought. Uh, I think uh, we have to see the 2030 agenda uh, is more than just a set of goals to be achieved by 2030. It is a long-term vision for a more sustainable and equitable world. The next bound after 2030 is to build on the progress that has been made and to continue working towards a more sustainable and equitable future. This will require continued commitment and cooperation from all stakeholders, including governments, businesses, civil society, and individuals. And that's why we have to um, face the discussion about the WCS Plus 20. This is a central uh, discussion to continue this 
conversation we having today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark, can I please ask you for your final takeaway? Thank you. Uh, that was a great discussion here today. And I, I all agree with what was discussed here. And I found uh, the, uh, the takeaway, main takeaway away from this discussion was the, this year, 2023, is the, the year of the, the finding the pathway for the future. So uh, I mean that the, uh, there is uh, some uh, d very difficult decision ahead of us. One is uh, like, like the, the last session we have discussed about the connectivity. And the, uh, I am just wondering uh, what is the best point for the considering the quality of the connectivity and also the capacity of the, co the connectivity. So that's a big difference. And the, the, the way to achieve the, the, the goal is very, very different. Uh, if we put the, the, the weight on the, the connectivity or quality of the infrastructure. And like, like this, and the, we have uh, a decision, we have to make a decision about the first, which is, which is the first, governance or opportunity. It's like the AI sessions and the also the data free sessions. So um, I think um, in, in the future we will, we will review the year 2023 as a big year for the thinking about the future. So that's like, like this and in this very important sessions. And thank you very much for jo joining this. Thank you very much. Uh, our first panelists had to go to their sessions, so uh, I will ask them to um, tweet out their, their takeaways. <laughs> Maybe you will see them uh, uh, online somewhere. Um, and with that, uh, all that is left for me is to thank you for your resilience for um, the la past two hours, really talking through some very thorny topics there. Um, but I think we've, we've managed to progress a bit of that conversation. Uh, you will read a summary um, uh, in our takeaway report. Um, and uh, I hope that we stay in touch, just like we did around this table, both with expert speakers and members of the audience. Um, and see you next year at the next IGF and throughout the week. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>